Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Boy, there can't be much infrastructure going on today, eh? I guess uh, you left a few uh, folks on the job to come here to Toronto. Uh, that's good. I'm delighted to be here with you today, and I want to thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I applaud the Council's efforts to foster stronger partnerships between the public and private sectors in the development of infrastructure, which is absolutely critical to our economic future. Hey, bonjour tout le monde. Je suis très heureux de me joindre à vous aujourd'hui, et merci de votre invitation. Comme je me trouve à Toronto, qui est très près à Oshawa, je vais vous parler en anglais. Toutefois, il me fera grand plaisir de répondre à vos questions en français et en anglais, bien sûr. So I'll speak today from the perspective of a monetary policymaker whose mandate also is to contribute to the economic and financial well-being of Canadians. And I'd like to talk about two subjects today. First, what we know, and second, what we don't know. And I'm sure it won't be a surprise to you that the first part will be much shorter. Now, my goal is to help you understand better the risks that we do face. And if I do my job well, I'll leave you with a sense of how the bank weighs the known and the unknown when we're setting monetary policy. So let's begin with what we do know about our current situation. Now, most of us acknowledge that this all began with a period of exceptionally strong global economic growth in the mid-2000s, some creative economic and financial engineering, an explosion of leverage, and a speculative bubble that touched a lot of markets. Now, the bubble burst when the U.S. housing market rolled over, and in the process, some significant financial vulnerabilities were laid bare. Now, the ensuing global financial crisis in the fall of 2008 was truly dire. Monetary policy and fiscal policy were quick to respond around the world, with collective G7 and G20 announcements on Thanksgiving weekend that year. Now, since then, we've seen policy rates near zero in several countries and an unprecedented use of unconventional monetary policy, including quantitative easing. Now, we will never know how bad things would have been without that aggressive, coordinated policy response. But as a student of economic history, I can say that all of the ingredients of a second Great Depression were present. Now, we've managed to avoid that extreme scenario, but the damage wrought by the Great Recession has been brutal nonetheless. By the end of last year, the loss to global output from the crisis was roughly $10 trillion. That's pretty close to 15% of the world's GDP. And today, there are over 60 million fewer jobs around the world than had the crisis not occurred. Still, memories of that near disaster are fading. And today, people are wondering why our policies have so far failed to foster a true global recovery, one that is natural, self-sustaining. Now, the G20 has acknowledged this disappointing growth outlook and has set out a plan to collectively boost global GDP by two points, 2% 2 over the next five years. Now, success will hinge on such policy actions as reforms to the functioning of labor markets, international trade liberalization, and investment in infrastructure, your favorite area, just to name a few. But these things are clearly worth doing, and that boost to global GDP will be worth having. Even so, when we see a world economy that is growing this slowly, despite the fact that interest rates are at historic lows, it's natural to ask some pretty basic questions. So let's turn to what we don't know. 
Let me focus on three questions that people have been asking me of late. The first is, what is preventing a full-fledged global economic recovery? And second, will there be any permanent damage to the economy due to the crisis and its aftermath? And third, by trying so hard to improve our situation, are policymakers simply sowing the seeds of the next financial crisis? Now, if interest rates are at zero, or nearly zero, it follows that something is holding the economy back. I want you to think of paddling a kayak against a strong headwind. It can take a lot of work just to hold your position, let alone make real progress. Now, it's widely agreed that the conditions that led to the financial crisis included taking on excessive leverage. And as individuals and financial institutions have attempted to deleverage in the wake of the crisis, economic growth has been held back. Now, it's difficult to say when the deleveraging process will be complete, at least at the global level. To illustrate, in the United States, private sector deleveraging was painful and swift as people cut back on debt and walked away from their over-mortgaged, devalued houses. In Europe, in contrast, this process is less well advanced. While in Canada, households continue to add to their debt loads. Now, another headwind has come from governments, which responded to the global recession with additional fiscal stimulus. And as the situation stabilizes, though, it's natural for governments to aim to bring their fiscal situation back towards balance. Now, this reversal of fiscal stimulus creates a second headwind for the economy as a whole masking perhaps the private sector recovery, which is happening underneath. Again, the status of this headwind varies from country to country, but it's clearly in play at the global level. The third, and probably the most important headwind, is lingering uncertainty about the future, whether it's from geopolitical developments, market volatility, or just the trauma that companies have been through. Some people look at companies with strong balance sheets and wonder why they're not investing. Some have suggested that we have too much risk-taking in financial markets, but not enough risk-taking in the real economy. But that's not what we're hearing from the companies that we talk to here in Canada. In this uncertain economic climate, companies actually feel like they're taking a lot of risk. Until the recovery is more certain, especially in export demand, for many, it's simply too risky to expand their business. And what that seems to mean is that the expected risk-adjusted rate of return on a new investment can appear quite low to a company. And we can settle into a temporary low-confidence, low-investment equilibrium even when borrowing costs are extraordinarily low. Until such time as uncertainty subsides and, of course, confidence returns. Now, it seems to me that we must allow for the possibility that the combined effects of these headwinds, deleveraging, fiscal normalization, and lingering uncertainty, will continue to restrain global economic growth for a prolonged period. We are confident that these headwinds will dissipate in time, but in the meantime, interest rates will remain lower than in the past in order to work against those forces. Still, it is important to acknowledge that global economic growth is simply not heading back to the high rates that we saw before the financial crisis. For one thing, those rates were boosted by unsustainable leverage. For another, we've entered, I include myself, the retirement window for the post-war baby boomers. And what that means is that the global economic capacity is moderating as growth in the workforce slows. In Canada, for instance, potential economic growth has drifted down to around 2% and will remain there for the next few years. Globally, potential growth is probably down to 3 to 3.5%. 3 now, both of these figures are lower than before the crisis 
But this modest deceleration in global growth potential is a natural consequence of demographics, not the product of the crisis. The more important question for us is whether any of the problems that we see today will become permanent. This question is relevant at the global level, but let me illustrate it with direct reference to our own situation here in Canada. Now, historically, a typical recession recovery cycle has taken a couple of years to complete. During the recession, let's say it originates with a drop in export demand. Companies cut back production, they lay off some workers, and investment and consumption spending fall. Monetary and fiscal policies respond, and exports recover, companies rehire their workers, and they move production back to normal. End of cycle. But this current cycle has not been a typical one. The downturn was deep, and it has proved to be very long-lasting. Canada's export sector not only cut back on production and laid off workers, many export companies restructured and many simply disappeared. Now, recent Bank of Canada research on exporters sifted through more than 2,000 categories of underperforming non-energy exports. And we found that the value of exports from about a quarter of them, that's around 500 product categories, has fallen by more than 75% since the year 2000. Now, had the exports of those products instead risen in line with foreign demand, they would have contributed about $30 billion in additional exports for Canada last year. Now, by correlating those findings with a huge data bank of media reports, we found that many of these 500 sectors were affected by factory closures or other restructurings. Now, obviously, not all of this can be blamed on the financial crisis and the ensuing downturn, but for companies that may have already been struggling with their competitiveness, the crisis surely accelerated things. The point is, when companies do downsize or relocate or close their doors, the effects on the economy are permanent. Those specific lost exports will not recover. Something else is more likely to take their place. But that requires that surviving companies expand or new exporting companies be created. And both of these processes are bound to be much slower than in the typical recession recovery scenario. Now, a destructive downturn like this one also creates long-lasting effects in our labor market, since the associated jobs that are lost are lost permanently. Now, we've recovered well from the employment losses during the downturn, but our labor market has not yet returned fully to normal. Indeed, labor conditions in Canada point to material slack in the economy. We've been creating jobs at a trend rate of less than 1%. That's well below what one would expect from an economy that is recovering. Furthermore, much of the recent employment growth has been part-time. There are over 900,000 people in Canada who are working part-time who would much rather be in a full-time job. And total hours worked for the economy as a whole are barely growing at all. And then there are the young people. Young people who are out of work, underemployed, or trying to improve their job prospects by extending their education. We estimate that there are around 200,000 of these people. I bet just about everybody in this room knows at least one family with adult children living in the basement. Hands up. Yeah. Now, I may, this is a guess, but I'm pretty sure these kids have not taken early retirement. Now, the good news is that these destructive, destructive effects that have happened during this recession should be reversible over time. Once we have seen a sustained increase in export demand, uncertainty about the future will diminish. 
and then firms will start to respond. Now, our research indicates that many of the export sectors that we expect to lead the expansion still have some excess capacity to meet higher demand. And this is one reason why our productivity growth has picked up recently. Firms are responding with the capacity that they have, and job creation has been very modest. But once those capacity limits are reached, exporting firms will begin to rebuild their production capacity with new investments, and job creation will pick up. Now, those same conditions will be ideal for fostering new firm creation. And as we all know, new companies create a disproportionate share of new jobs. Now, the implication is clear. A sustained expansion in our exports not only will represent new demand for Canada, it will ignite the rebuilding phase of our investment cycle and that in turn will create new supply. This virtuous circle then continues until the excess capacity in the labor market is reabsorbed and the kids move out of the basement. Now by our estimation, it will take around two years for us to use up our excess capacity, at which point inflation will be sustainably at our target. But in the meantime, continued monetary stimulus is needed to keep that process in motion. And if the headwinds that we discussed earlier persist, continued policy stimulus may still be needed to offset them even after the excess capacity has been absorbed. So to summarize to this point, the global headwinds that are preventing a return to natural self-sustaining growth remain considerable. And some of the damage already experienced in our economy will be long lasting. But on the positive side, our conservative assessment is that global momentum is building, Canada is beginning to benefit, and with the assistance of continuing monetary stimulus, we can return to natural growth at full capacity over the next two years. So this leads me to my third and final question. Is all of this monetary stimulus simply sowing the seeds of the next financial crisis? The side effects of aggressive and prolonged monetary stimulus are well known. It promotes excessive risk taking in financial markets. It promotes excessive borrowing by individuals. These are the very ingredients that led to the 2008 financial crisis in the first place. Accordingly, this question merits a serious response. Now, to begin, we knew back in 2008 that stimulative monetary policies would encourage people to borrow more, to buy more homes, and buy more cars. That's why we do it. It's to buffer the downturn in the economy. This, in fact, happens in every business cycle, not just this one. But what distinguishes this cycle is its duration, which is leading to a buildup of financial stability risks over time. Now, we study these risks in detail in our financial system review. It's published twice a year. Wait for it. The next issue is December the 10th. Importantly, the world has changed since 2008. A key commitment of the G20 in 2008 was to strengthen the global financial system. That work is very well advanced, and the system is far better capitalized and much more resilient today. Furthermore, there have been a variety of macroprudential policy changes that have made the system safer. Here in Canada, for example, we've strengthened the rules around mortgage market in several ways. But those changes combined with the very high quality underwriting even before those changes were made, make the Canadian situation today very different from what we saw in the United States just before the crisis. With that being said, some critics would still say we are running the risk of creating the next financial crisis through our actions. Now I might ask in response, what is it you would have us do then? As the central bank, we only have one real channel of influence, which is to set short-term interest rates. And right now, we are providing monetary stimulus sufficient to bring inflation sustainably to our target within a reasonable time frame, around two years from now. 
Now, to argue that we should instead set interest rates in a way that reduces financial stability risks is clearly a call for higher interest rates. So let's walk through a thought experiment together. What would our world look like today if instead of keeping interest rates low to stimulate the economy, both Canada and the United States had moved their policy rates back up to neutral at the beginning of 2011? Now, we estimate that the neutral rate of interest today is between 3 and 4% for Canada. And we use a similar number for the United States. So our thought experiment is to raise rates to about 3.5% in both countries. And what would that look like? Now, such a move would, of course, allow those headwinds we talked about earlier to blow us backwards. We estimate that under this hypothetical scenario, the output gap in Canada would have been around 5.5% today instead of 1%. That means that unemployment rate would today be about two percentage points higher than it is today. And core inflation would be running somewhere between 0% and 1%. Now, most of the impact would be felt in reduced housing construction and renovation and auto production, as these were the sectors that responded to the policies that we put in place after the crisis. And these estimates do not capture the range of confidence effects that would permeate the rest of the economy under such a difficult scenario. So in fact, the story could even be worse. Now from this monetary policymaker's perspective, that's an unattractive alternative. Our primary job is to pursue our 2% inflation target with a degree of flexibility around the time horizon of its achievement and that flexibility permits the bank to give due consideration to financial stability risks, provided that they do not threaten macroeconomic performance. Currently, as you know, inflation is close to target, but some of its strength is due to temporary factors, such as increases in the price for meat, electricity, telecommunications, and the pass-through of our past exchange rate depreciation. Now, unless the output gap closes as we expect over the next two years, inflation will drift back down significantly below 2% as the temporary effects of these factors wear off. Meanwhile, though, financial stability risks are clearly on our radar, and in particular, housing activity is showing renewed momentum, and consumer debt levels are very high. So household imbalances appear to be edging higher. But it is our judgment that our policy of aiming to close the output gap and ensuring inflation remains on target will be consistent with an eventual easing in those household imbalances. Accordingly, we judge that the overall risks of attaining our inflation target over a reasonable time frame fall into the zone of balance at this time. So let me conclude. I put a lot of emphasis today on the things that we don't know. It's important to underscore that we have a wide range of tools, some of them very sophisticated, others as simple as having conversations with Canadian companies to help us reach judgments on these issues. The bank's approach to policy is evolving in light of these developments. We've made some major advances in our thinking in the past year and in the transparency with which we present these issues to you. Many of the key variables that are essential to our policy decision, measures of capacity, the neutral rate of interest, our outlook for growth, our outlook for inflation, and so on, are now conveyed to you in ranges, not as points. And these elements of uncertainty are being explicitly incorporated into our decision making. And what this demands is that we think of monetary policy as an exercise in risk management. And although we regard the risks around attaining our inflation target over a reasonable time frame to be balanced, as policymakers, we acknowledge that in the current situation, the consequences of an upside risk would be much more manageable than those associated with a downside risk. If this makes central bankers seem overly preoccupied with downside risks, 
and seem gloomy to you, then take heart, because we're just doing our jobs. Thank you. All right, Steve, thank you very much. That's pretty cool. Well, I, understood, I understood most of it. Um, so uh, we have asked uh, folks to uh, send some questions up uh, on their app, and they have responded. Look okay. at that. They're cool. going to just keep coming. OK. So I figure we'll be out of here by about mm, 4. OK. So, so let's, let's, those look like really hard questions, Mark. So let's go to the next slide. <laughs> so. Well, let's test you out. Okay. okay. Right? I okay. mean, uh, you do have the job. All right. All right. So the first question is, will Canadian consumers need to go through a similar deleveraging as Europeans have? Well, that is actually a really good question. And uh, we believe the answer is no. That In fact, uh, we are in a stage where, yes, household imbalances have reached an historic peak and given the stimulus that we've had to housing and car sales. But as the economy recovers, as we predict, bear in mind that the denominator of these measures is going up nicely, right? That's more income, more debt service capability, more new jobs, and so on. So what we believe is that there will be kind of a shift in the share of GDP, less spending on housing and renovation, and so on, a moderation of that while exports come up to fill that and create all those jobs. And of course, those folks who get their jobs will go out and buy themselves a car and so on, so there's more income to support it. So it's, it's not a math trick. Uh, it's actually the way things should evolve. It's just taking a lot longer than we originally thought. Thank you. So question number two. With a 10-year, $48 billion impact on GDP, what role have and will public-private partnerships play in Canada's economic recovery? Well, that's easy. That's $4.8 billion per year. <laughs> Which is a good thing. <laughs> well done. Uh, how important are public infrastructure investments to the economy vis-a-vis -vis private infrastructure investments? Well, that's a, I don't know what the answer to that could be. There's a room full of experts, and I'll just get killed for whatever answer I give. So, but, I, but I do think that this, it depends on the infrastructure. I mean, all infrastructure is a positive. It, it's the sort of thing that gives us the productivity, the cost reductions, all that competitiveness effect. And whether the market failure is a deep one that requires more public uh, involvement versus a shallow one where less is needed, that's uh, something for the experts in this room to determine. But we know all types exist. Uh, when the market failure is big enough, you really can't get it done without some form of public lift, right? It's been true of our entire history. It hasn't suddenly changed. But uh, so it's a role for everything. I hope that uh, the private sector is doing the most of it. That's, that's where I start from. But I know there are just some things that simply won't happen without that at least P3 structure or a public direct involvement. Is that given the one hand, the other hand? Okay. okay, as long as we're good though. You must be an economist. I uh, must be. <laughs> given global demographics, what should be a reasonable long-term growth expectation? Is wealth concentration in the hands of a few a contributing factor? Okay, so uh, global demographics, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, there, there was a baby, there was a global baby boom, and so the, the charts I've been a, if you look at the charts on this, it's extraordinary how much our workforce expanded. Okay, uh, you know, back in the mid, you know, sort of mid 50s to early 60s, like that. So, so you get this big bulge, and that boosts global growth potential for that whole time period. Now we're just coming down the other side of that, and the pace will depend on how, at what speed do we retire, and and uh, and at what speed are we uh, generating the next. Uh, demographic wave, the echo. But all roughly speaking, the global economy used to think it could be 4% as a trend line. We now say somewhere between 3 and 3.5% 3 .5 as its long-term growth potential. So when you see moderations in the growth in places like China or Brazil, you have to kind of take all that into account. That, you know, 
China doesn't necessarily grow all by itself, right? It, it grows by selling things to all the rest of us. And so all those things are connected together. That trend line is definitely slowing. And for Canada, it's slowed from, say, it was peaked at around 3 It's now around 2%. So those are the realities of our situation. Uh, that doesn't necessarily determine what our growth rate of our actual income is, because that will, the wedge, of course, is productivity, new technologies, those kinds of things where we can add to our growth rate of income per person. And so you ask, you know, does the wealth concentration issue play into this? Uh, some parts of the literature suggest it does, and others it doesn't. I don't have a, a fixed view on that, uh, but let's just say that we know that uh, over time, uh, you know, if it's, if, if it's Downton Abbey, the downstairs folks have more fun. <laughs> but, but, but more importantly is that over this long stretch of time, we get this sort of ebb and flow in the, the big investment cycle. And we've, we've been in that sort of period where the income gap, the things that people talk about, distribution of income, has gotten larger, and it tends to get smaller and equilibrate over time. But that's, those forces are Mother Nature forces, very slow moving. Okay, thank you. So as the governor of the Bank of Canada, and given the risks to the global economic recovery, where would you invest your money these days? Um, well, if I could own a bridge or something. Because <laughs> uh, I know, or an airport, something that I know would get used and I just collect, you know, a buck each, off each person. That would be a great investment. Uh, but otherwise, I think as the governor of the Bank of Canada, I would just invest in a blind trust. <laughs> so. So there's one last question. Okay. So, so given your very impressive academic credentials and the lofty positions you've had over the course of, the, of your career and, and the unbelievable position you have now, um, what do you figure are the odds the Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup? Well, I'm a, I grew up in Oshawa when, when Dave Keon was the captain. Okay? So, you know, I, I remember really well 1967. And it seemed like just yesterday. <laughs> so every, every season, I think it's 67 all over again. And what do you know, here it comes again. <laughs> so I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, and uh, still, of course, I gotta pay attention to what goes on with the Ottawa Senators. That's the way it is. Uh, they're, they're a great team and they're close by. So, but I still have a hard thing for the, uh, for the Leafs and I'm sure they'll do well, absolutely well. Still, over time, the best sports team ever, right? How's that? You clearly missed the point that I am a Montreal Canadiens fan. And Montreal stands a good chance of competing. Monique, I'll still give him the farewell gift, but I, I'm, it's uh, up, up for review. So that's a pretty impressive set of remarks, you